So we've been having some cold nights and my wife came up to me and said, you know, my electric blanket isn't working. Uh, it, it, uh, it's turning off and, and the, the, the display is showing E for error and, it, and it's not heating. And so naturally I ignored her. And then uh, a month or so went by and she came by and she says, well, now I can't change the temperature on the thing at all. It, 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 it's just, it's just uh, flashing E and the E is, is uh, uh, flickering and uh, it won't do anything. So, you know, I ignored her again because my side of the bed was working great. Um, so what's the problem? And uh, uh, then finally, I went to go to bed uh, uh, a week ago and, and she's on my side of the bed because it's freezing and her side of the bed doesn't work. Uh, so then I realized I probably had to address this problem. We have um, these uh, Biddeford um, electric blankets. Um, uh, this is a very popular brand. Um, and these have these microprocessor based controls. Uh, this is the, hang on a second, let me grab a note here. This is the TC12BOD uh, controller. Uh, this was patented in uh, uh, 1999, I think. And uh, this one's probably from 2010 or so, it's probably about nine years old. Um, all these Biddeford controls are, are similar. Um, uh, I think this is, uh, let's see, I was looking online. This may be the same as the TCI. 5B2, don't know if I have that right, but anyway. So what I'm gonna tell you in this video is probably applicable to that or other microprocessor controlled um, controllers uh, that have the, uh, the four wires going to the, to, the, to the mattress that look like that there. Um, and yeah, so you have your on off, well, you, have, you have your on off, you have your power on up, and then usually a, a number here uh, showing the temperature and there's a power light, which is actually the decimal point in this um, seven segment display. Um, so the easiest way to fix one of these controllers is to buy one on eBay for 20 bucks. And when it arrives, pray it doesn't smell like cigarette smoke or dryer sheets or something and it actually works. Uh, failing that, if you really want to get into it and troubleshoot the controller yourself, uh, hopefully uh, what I'm about to tell you in this video will be of some assistance. Uh, the reason I'm making the video is because the other ones I saw on YouTube were either dangerous or obvious or superficial. Um, and it turns out I got more into uh, electric blanket controllers than I intended to uh, troubleshooting this one. It's kind of a fun technology. There's a lot of smarts in here and the actual uh, circuitry and whatnot is uh, kind of old, simple through hole stuff that's sort of easy to, to work with. And so it's, it's, it's kind of enjoyable. So we'll start with looking at uh, the setup in the bedroom and how to test the wiring in the blanket to make sure it's okay uh, before you begin work on the controller. And then I'll take you on a tour through the circuit board of the controller and, and how the thing actually works inside, uh, which will give you sort of the lay of the land uh, to attack any problems in your specific situation that you may come across. And then finally, hopefully, uh, I'll figure out what's wrong with my wife's and, and fix it. So let's get started. So welcome to the end of my bed. This cable I'm dragging behind me is a microphone. So here's the setup. This is my side of the bed, which works perfectly and keeps me toasty warm at night. And this is my wife's side of the bed, which is broken and leaves her cold in the night. In contrast with looking at me in the bed every night, which probably also leaves her cold, but is not a problem that's so easy to address. Uh, anyway, we wanna know if the uh, wiring inside the blanket here on the broken side is okay, because if it is seriously broken, there's really nothing to be done. Um, there's no way to fix it safely, or at least I wouldn't attempt it. So the question is, how do we test the wiring uh, inside uh, the broken side of the blanket. And you may say to yourself, hey, I've got a working controller over here. And, and indeed, the controller that works is a great test device because it has a microprocessor in it that's dedicated to doing nothing except checking the status of the wiring inside the blanket. So you take your good controller and you plug it into your side that's not working and you turn it on. And indeed, if it comes on and everything works, that proves the problem is in the, the controller that, that doesn't seem to be working, and that's great. The problem with this approach is, if there is a serious fault inside the blanket, showing the good controller to the, the wiring fault inside the blanket may cause the, the good controller to break. It may blow out the, the fuse or the thermal fuse or the mauve inside of it, and now you've got two broken controllers, which is, you know, not great considering you could have sold that other good controller uh, on eBay for 20 bucks uh, when, after you threw out the blanket. So we want to test uh, the wiring inside the blanket uh, without using a controller, and we'll do it with a multimeter, and this is how you do that. All right, so we have our multimeter, and I'm going to stick it on 
resistance and turn the backlight on there so you can see it. And we'll take this out. And this is completely dead. There's nothing in here that can bite you. So it's just uh, two, two loops of wire, uh, conceptually. And you can think of these pins as one, two, three, four. Um, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you could, the real way to think of them is outside and inside. The outside pins are the heater loop. The inside pins are the sensing loop. And the sensor wire is a very thin nickel wire that's wrapped around the, the heating uh, wire. Anyway, so we want to test the resistance of the heating wire, and we want that to be very low in the hundreds of ohms kind of deal because we want it to pass a lot of current and make a lot of heat. So I will touch pins one and four as you are looking at it. And we get 112 ohms, so that's nice and low, and that tells us that that's fine. Now we want to test the sensing wire, so the middle pins, two and three, and that's the sensing loop. And we need continuity, and we'd like to get about a kilo ohm um, when it's cold. Let me get the blanket off of it there. I think I got it. There we go. And there we go, 955 ohms, so that's, that's pretty close. Um, and then the final thing we want to check, let me turn the beep on. Uh, is uh, uh, but to see if there's any shorts between the heating wire and the sensing wire. So you can touch pins one and two, or three and four, uh, or what, four and two and one and three. Anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna test one and two here and they should stay open. And indeed, it's open. So now we know all the wiring inside the blanket is fine and we can go on and look at the controller. Anyway, uh, this is uh, my wife's board, and if you take uh, three screws out of the back of the case, you can push on the cables from the back after you take the front off and, and slide the board out like this. I guess now's a good time to remind you that this board has live uh, mains electricity on it, and if you touch it in the wrong way while it's plugged in, uh, potentially it could kill you. So if you lack the necessary skills to do this kind of stuff, you should definitely have a few drinks first. All right. Let's get into this. Let's get close. We'll take a little tour of the board. But first, I have a confession to make. I've actually already fixed this because as I was preparing to uh, shoot this, I figured out what was wrong. But we'll go over that. Um, actually, I can show you. It was, it was this capacitor here, which I have replaced, um, that was causing the problem. But to get there, I had to analyze this circuit in some detail. So let me share that with you uh, so that you can use what I've discovered uh, in your own exploration. So here's our board, and as I said, it's um, it's nice through hole technology. Everything's labeled. It's kind of a kind of a throwback. It's easy to work on. It's nice. The way to uh, think about this board is that everything on the left uh, side is uh, digital and has to do and DC and has to do with um, uh, running uh, electronics, and everything on the right side is analog and has to do with powering the the whole board, powering the heating loop. And um, that's not entirely true because this little section down here has some analog components as it, <coughs> excuse me, monitors the um, uh, sensing loop. But generally, this side's uh, uh, digital DC, this side's analog AC. Um, I discovered that there is a date on this board of July 2015. So if you have a, a July 2015 board, everything I'm about to say will apply to you. Now it turns out I went in on eBay and bought another uh, controller for 20 bucks and it did smell like dryer sheets uh, when I decided to do this video because I figured I could uh, use it for parts and also if I wasn't able to fix this one, um, it would be good to have another one to swap in and keep my wife happy. It turns out, it uh, looks like um, I'll be able to uh, fix that one and sell it again on eBay for 20 bucks to somebody else. So that's, so that's good. But anyway, when I opened up that one I got on eBay, it turned out it has a board that is dated 2010 inside of it. So um, it is a different board. The, the general idea is the same, but the components are laid out a little differently. And uh, if you have a, a 2010 board, then, then um, uh, you're gonna have to do a little adjustment uh, from the information I'm, I'm uh, uh, giving you here because because the, the values are a little different the layouts a little different uh, And we'll take a look at the 2010 board towards the end of this a little bit and just just briefly kind of see what some of the difference are Differences are this whole thing is kind of an exercise in how cheaply you can make something and be efficient. So it's, it's rather clever um, in that regard 
Um, besides the kind of uh, digital analog uh, divide, um, we can kind of think of this in terms of, of functions. Uh, this is an 8-bit microprocessor that's controlling everything that's going on uh, on the board. It runs the UI and it uh, monitors uh, the sensing loop uh, um, operation. Uh, and in doing that is assisted by uh, this chip, which is an LM393, which is a double, uh, which is two uh, voltage uh, comparators. So uh, the, the basic idea is that you have uh, two input lines with different voltages. And if one of them is higher than the other, then an output line is driven higher low, depending on uh, which line is um, uh, higher. And as I say, there's, there's two of them in this, and, and they have uh, different uh, uh, responsibilities. Uh, over here is a triac that controls the uh, heating loop. It's kind of like a dimmer on a light, except uh, this doesn't actually vary the duty cycle. It just switches the, the heating loop on and off. And, uh, and so those are the big three black things um, on the board. There's also a couple of little uh, transistors. There's this, or this is a thri, th thri this is T2, it's a thrisistor, <laughs> which is uh, associated with uh, these two um, uh, heating resistors, and we'll talk about those in a while. This is the famous um, thermal fuse. And, um, and then there's also a, a regular uh, switching transistor here that controls uh, 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 when the uh, monitoring uh, of the sensing loop is done by, by this guy uh, over here. Uh, if we look across the bottom, the wires are very much similar to the uh, jack we, we were looking at when we did our continuity test. So the heating loop is on the outside. There's H1 and H2. And then the sensing loop's on the inside. This is S1 and S2. And then the neutral from the uh, mains is here, and then the hot is from the uh, mains is right there. So if we look at this operationally, uh, this is this is running the controller. This is monitoring the the sensing loop, sensor loop, and giving um, the um, microcontroller information about how the sensing loop is is working. And um, uh, and then this is is switching the the heating loop uh, on and off. Um, I guess a good place to start is with this LM393. So one half of this, the half closest to the, uh, the processor, the way the board is laid out here, is, uh, is uh, concerned with letting the microprocessor know what the temperature of the, the bed is. Now, as I said before, the, um, the sensing wire is a very small, like 30, 31 gauge uh, nickel wire that uh, resistance varies pretty linear, linearly with um, with temperature. And so uh, by monitoring the resistance of that, you can sort of uh, figure out the, the temperature. And so the top half or the one side of this is concerned with um, um, providing a temperature reading to the microprocessor. And the way that works is that, uh, yes, the sensing loop actually comes into uh, one of the, I think the inverting input on, 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 on this comparator. And then uh, on the other side, on the non-inverting input, is uh, a line from the microprocessor to compare against. And that line is driven by these four uh, uh, pins here at the top of the, of the microprocessor. This is a 24-pin uh, dip, so it's a little um, unusual uh, package. And so that's why I don't think this microcontroller is a, uh, uh, an 8051 or a PIC or anything. I think it's some kind of oddball. Uh, chip. It's impossible to know because obviously Biddeford makes enough of these that they're able to get their program mass rommed inside it at the factory, and then the factory puts their their part number on it. So it's 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 so its uh, original provenance is kind of kind of hidden from us. But anyway, by uh, by having these four pins and there's two uh, parallel ports inside here at the top on the on the first uh, eight or so pins of of each side. Um, but uh, these first four, one, two. Uh, 24 and 23 uh, 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 allow the microprocessors to provide different voltages to one of the uh, uh, to the non-inverting input of one of the um, uh, comparators inside this this chip, uh, setting kind of a reference level. And I, actually, since there's four of these, I guess potentially there's 16 uh, voltage levels that could be um, generated by the by the microprocessor for this. And and then you compare the 
the or the microprocessor program would compare the um, uh, voltage on the other pin, which is coming from the uh, sensing loop, uh, to the reference voltage it is putting out on some combination of these four pins. And if it if the output goes high or low, uh, that would tell you whether the temperature of the um, uh, blanket is is in the is in the area um, um, you think it is. So inside here is a uh, inside the program is a is a table that converts ranges of resistant values to approximate temperatures, and perhaps there are sixteen slots um, if they if they use them all. Uh, the output from that side comes into pin six, uh, one two three four five six, on the uh, microprocessor. So that's your that's your sense. Um, sensor loop temperature um, uh, in or, or is what you what you think it is based on what these four uh, uh, resistors are. That is, if you were a, uh, a microprocessor looking at things. Uh, it's not quite that simple because on the uh, inverting input, um, the microprocessor can also uh, uh, mix in some uh, current with what's coming in from the, on the sensor. And I don't know whether this is an, an enable or a disable or, or part of the adjustments. I haven't really analyzed um, uh, how it works. It kind of goes through this constellation of components down here. But essentially, um, I think it's pin 15, uh, uh, sorry, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, 15, 15 and 16 here on the microprocessor drive uh, the um, emitter of Q1, which is then also coupled into the, the other uh, input on this, this side of the LM393. Uh, so that participates uh, in uh, um, letting this thing do uh, temperature setting in ways I don't fully understand. Uh, the other side of the LM393 is kind of an automatic feedback loop uh, that I believe is doing current sensing on the on the sense loop, uh, so that if uh, or actually on the heater, excuse me, this is um, and, and so if the if the if the heater starts to draw a ton of current all of a sudden, um, it throws open this um, uh, uh, T2 this uh, this resistor here uh, that suddenly starts sucking a ton of current down these two uh, resistors, which heat up this um, thermal fuse and makes the thermal fuse blow, and that means you have a fault. So if the thermal fuse blows, and it blows at 102 degrees centigrade, which is what, 215 degrees Fahrenheit, um, uh, uh, then you have a problem. Now, uh, as I said before, um, uh, you'll notice mine is a little charred here. Uh, it turns out if you're probing around and you touch pin eight of the LM393 and load it, it uh, it drives the uh, T2 into uh, uh, saturation and it and it latches. So even when you take your your probe away, um, it keeps these resistors conducting at full strength and uh, heats this up and blows it after like half a minute. And it smells real bad. And so yes, I had to go get another one of these and and stick it in here. Um, it takes a little while and you can smell it before it goes. I see there was another YouTuber who um, jumpered this when, it, when his opened and, and he wound up burning a big hole in his board. So this can be pretty dangerous uh, and you want to um, <laughs> uh, uh, respect it. Um, so I think that pretty well covers the two halves uh, of this. One half is for temperature sensing for this guy and the other half of, of the LM393 is part of a closed uh, feedback loop that's monitoring current in the, in the heater. And uh, if, if things get out of hand, it'll blow this this thermal fuse. We'll go we'll go through this side in a in a minute. Why don't we finish up on the uh, microprocessor while we're while we're in here? So these these first four go through these blue precision resistors to to give references to the LM three ninety three, and then the next set of pins, these uh, three resistors here, and these one, two, three, four, five or so here drive the seven segment. Uh, LED display on the other side that shows the the, the number of the current um, uh, setting of the temperature or uh, E if there's an error uh, or high or H if it, if uh, if you're all the way up at the up at the top and then um, as I said this pin 15 besides turning on this uh, Q1 transistor here also lights up the decimal point in the seven segment display so that you know that it's um, 
uh, uh, powered on. So that's your that's your power indicator light. Um, and then the the other pins we've we've kind of talked about most of them. Uh, six is the input uh, from the um, uh, uh, 393 saying whether uh, the the temperature is in the range. Uh, uh, the, 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 the resistors have, have asked for up here. Um, and then the next three are the, uh, switches. Uh, seven is, uh, temperature down, eight is temperature up and nine is on and off. So 12, 11, 10, nine. So that's, that's on and off, um, there. And all these switches do is, uh, ground, they, they ground out that, that pin. So when the processor wakes up, it probably goes into a halt state uh, almost immediately after doing some initial checks. And then it waits for a, um, oops, sorry, didn't mean to bang the camera. And then it waits for a falling edge on uh, pin nine and, and that wakes it up with an interrupt and then it knows it's time to uh, run its program and turn the, the decimal point on the uh, LED on and do its safety checks and, and all that uh, sort of thing. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is ground. And then uh, uh, this pin, uh, 10 and uh, uh, 12, are the uh, clock for the uh, uh, MCU. And I, and I think it's running at 60 hertz, actually. So they've set up kind of a poor man's ugly square wave generator with a couple of resistors in series and a reverse bios, reversed biased uh, Zener diode. Uh, uh, to to make a a square wave on 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 uh, on on these pins. So the, there's your clock. Obviously, that's an obvious thing to check if you're doing uh, troubleshooting on your own. Um, we haven't talked about pin 13. This is I don't think this is the um, the gate for the triac. So by modulating this pin, the the triac can be switched on and off, and you can switch the AC current on and off to the the heating element. Uh, then, uh, going up further here, there are some no connects, um, right in, 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 in this range. I think that may be it. I don't think there's anything, anything else. Yeah. I, I think maybe that this is, uh, these two are for a reset switch or something, but, the, but it's not stuff. There's, there's nothing, um, connected there. And then. Um, 15, as we said, is the, is the power on. So that's kind of the, um, lay of the land of the microprocessor. So coming over to the, the analog side of the board, the hot comes in here, goes through this two amp fuse, this MOV, uh, uh, metal oxide, uh, varistor is across the line. This is to handle any transient, um, spikes. And since I had to replace this, um, film capacitor here, I'm suspicious that this went out too or had some problems because something damaged this. These don't usually go out. And so maybe just out of superstition, but also out of caution, I'm going to change this uh, mob before I put it back together. They also get old, um, you know, so there's, uh, there's that too. Then the um, uh, hot goes through the, the famous thermal fuse here. People tend to think of this as um, having a piece of wax in it that melts. It's not really a wax material, but... You have two pieces of metal that are encased in a um, in a low melting uh, material, and 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 when these two resistors heat up, uh, then that melts and a spring pushes the wires apart, and this thing opens. And once it opens, you have to take it out and replace it because it doesn't uh, automatically reset in any way. So if your controller is dead completely, then this may have uh, been the thing that 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 goes out. But you don't want to just slap one in here and say everything's great because there's obviously some fault that made this go in the first place. Now, if you did the continuity check I went through earlier on your bed with a multimeter and that passed okay, then the mattress is probably, uh, the mattress, the um, blanket is probably okay. So, I mean, it is certainly possible that there is a fault inside the controller with a T2 or any of the circuitry that supports it that is that is making this stay on and is blowing your fuse up instead of the, the mattress. And that's something to check. Uh, this is a across the line, uh, uh, capacitor. Um, I'm surprised it's not a safety capacitor, um, for, for safety. And then I assume this was, was also for ripple, but obviously it is creating ripple or it did create ripple before I uh, changed it. Then the, the, the hot power comes up through, through this resistor and through this diode here, which is D eight. And 
right here on the cathode of D8 is a great place to um, uh, pick off uh, unregulated uh, uh, DC uh, power. And um, I find I get about 9 volts when the system is off and about 6 volts when it's on. They immediately run that uh, unregulated half-wave rectified uh, AC, which is now kind of pulsy DC, into these two uh, Zener diodes, which are reverse BIOS and acting as uh, voltage regulators. So Z2 here, uh, the cathode of Z2, is a great place to pick off the, the, the regulated uh, DC, and it is exactly 5 volts on, uh, on this board. So, and that kind of makes sense for the, the logic here that that's what, what it would be. So this is a great place to uh, check. And I might, I might also say that there's all these other jumpers on this uh, board. These two jump the sensor wire into the circuitry so you can monitor the sensor wires here. But the really interesting one is, is JP5, which is a nice ground. It's an easy ground to get to. This doesn't exist on the 2010 board, by the way, but it does exist on this board. And um, on the other, on the back side of this board, uh, like this half to here is one ground plane, and then this half back to the middle is another ground plane, and JP5 is the thing that connects them together, so it's a really excellent place. So if you want to check your power in one of these, put a, put a ground on there and put your probe on the cathode of uh, Z2 there, and you should get 5 volts, and it should be nice and clean and steady, and that's what you want. So... So yeah, so your power comes in here, winds its way around here, goes to here, and then goes kind of to the digital side to the rest of the, the rest of the board. I don't think there's much else to uh, talk about here. This is, as I say, this is the the triac. Uh, I believe this is this is the gate. This is uh, T2, the output of the triac, which is going to the heating loop, and then this is the the bottom pin here is is ground. So I think that's all we need to say for our kind of fast tour of of, of how the board works. Uh, you may ask yourself. Uh, uh, Ward, how do you know all this stuff? And and um, um, honestly, when I went to uh, troubleshoot this thing, I um, before I knew I was going to make a video and to, and to uh, make my wife happy and fix her uh, controller, I opened this thing up and I tested all of the electrolytic uh, capacitors to make sure they were okay, and they were. And I tested all the silicon junctions uh, on here to see if they were uh, working okay, and they were. And I tested all the resistors to see if there were any opens or dead shorts. I didn't actually check all the individual values and they were fine. So the board seemed fine and I was really perplexed. Of course, I didn't, I didn't check these film capacitors uh, because the polys never go bad. <laughs> so there you go. So that got me uh, interested in, in why this thing was, was thwarting me so. And I wound up actually drawing out a, a schematic of this uh, as best I could. I photocopied the other side and uh, used it, uh, and as I found where components were, I, I drew them in, and then I actually uh, wrote out uh, two schematic pages, one of uh, the kind of the power circuitry over here and one of the, of the digital side. It just worked out that way on a couple of pieces of paper. So what I'll do, and I hope they're correct, they're as correct as I, I could make them, um, I'll, I'll scan them and clean them up and post them, a link to them underneath this video so that you guys can have them, and then those of you who know, uh, electronics uh, better than I can can chime in and say what I've uh, uh, gotten wrong or, or explained uh, in, incorrectly. So three days ago when I originally troubleshooted this, figured out what was wrong and changed this um, uh, capacitor here, I shot some uh, footage of the um, uh, scope screen and I have that. So what I'm going to do now is, is go through what I did and cut that scope footage in uh, as though I'm doing it live so you can have you know the exciting experience of discovery that, that I had. Um, I put this board on an isolation transformer. Um, it, it, really, you need a proper differential probe to do this to make it really safe, but, eh, you know. Um, so, uh, uh, I put it on the isolation transformer, of course, and then I clip my uh, scope lead to JP5 for a ground, introducing uh, a new ground reference and making the isolation transformer probably uh, uh, worthless. But anyway, there you go. The other thing is the isolation transformer has a nice switch on it. It makes it easy to turn the whole circuit on and off. So uh, the first thing I wanted to do, since the um, display was flickering, except for the, the decimal point, uh, I later found out at this uh, 5.6 hertz rate, I think, 5.4 hertz rate, um, I wanted to see if the microprocessor was actually the one doing the driving or whether there was some loose connection or some something flaky going on with the ground or something. So the first thing I tested 
was uh, one of the pins that drives the, the seven, seven segment L, L, LED to see uh, if the microprocessor was indeed the one uh, raising and lowering all the um, uh, seven segments of the, of, the, of the number. And indeed it was, except that the waveform looked really, really crummy. Uh, with a lot of uh, ripple and, and noise on top of it. Now, did that mean there wasn't sufficient voltage? And when he tried to drive it, it was it was collapsing? Or was it just a noisy signal? I didn't know. So that was the first clue. Then I was probing around on these pins because I wanted to figure out what they uh, did. So I went down here to um, uh, one of the X1, X2 lines so I could see the, the clock going in. And indeed... Um, the clock was, was running, but again, if you look at the top of this waveform, you can see that it has uh, kind of an up and down uh, curve to it, which isn't uh, uh, very good at all. And then finally, I went over here to, to Z2 and looked at the 5-volt regulated output. And my goodness, this was the, the worst of all. There was that uh, kind of triangle wave on, on top of the... Um, power supply and it was and it was if you zoom in on it it's really like being on the ocean it's it's so terrible anyway so then i knew i really had um power supply problems that needed to be resolved there may have been a secondary problem i didn't know about uh but it was certainly important to address that. So the first thing I did was uh, go in here and change uh, C2, this 470 microfarad uh, capacitor, because it's a filtering capacitor. And when I tested it, it was um, at 560 uh, microfarad, which is just about out of tolerance. It's like, <laughs> um, actually, it practically is out of tolerance. And ordinarily, that wouldn't be bad, because more capacity here on a filter is good, with an ESR of uh, 0.13, according to my little cheap M tester here. Um, uh, but I went ahead and changed it with this, with this, with this purple guy. Here's the, here's the broken guy who, who came out, poor fellow. And, uh, put the new purple one in. That one's much closer, uh, um, uh, at, uh, uh, let's see, 479 with, a, uh, with also an ESR, well, 0.19. So it's, it's, it's close in that way. And then after that was done, I, uh, you know, connected this up. And went back in here with the uh, with the probe, and it made no difference at all. So then I figured my problem was uh, somewhere uh, uh, earlier down the line, and the obvious candidate to look at was 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 this guy. So I took this out, and then um, instead of taking a uh, the the same capacitor from the 2010 board. I went ahead and took it uh, from my working, <laughs> from the, the board, from the controller on my side that keeps me warm at night, because that's how much I love my wife, to, uh, uh, to see if that would uh, address this. And so, I, so this, this capacitor here is from my good controller. Put that in, went back, you know, connected the probe up, uh, went back to here, and lo and behold, is just about perfect. So that was obviously the, the problem. And again, something damaged it, I don't know what, but we'll you know change the mob and, and pray, I guess. So I think before we go ahead and plug the uh, 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 sense lines and heating lines into the, into the actual mattress, and I annoy my wife further by uh, yanking it off the bed and sticking it on the floor in here to plug it in, uh, w we should maybe take a moment and, and flip this over and take a look at just briefly at the, at the other side. So there's not much to see here. When I published the schematic, I also did. I also photocopied this side and then drew where the components were in, in an ink pen, uh, so I could kind of figure out the way the things went to, together here. And I will uh, uh, include that in the in the PDF. I'll I'll link to. And I went ahead and I colored the ground plane yellow with a highlighter, so you can kind of see where the ground is uh, in this uh, on this foil. There's a lot of pads on this side that are um, do not go all the way through, uh, but have solder on them. I think this is for bed of nails testing in the in the factory. Uh, so they have a little device with with um, uh, conductors that come up, and then they can test um, the various uh, sub 
subcomponents of the board before it leaves the before it leaves the factory. Uh, and there's not much else to see here. This is the on-off switch, and this is the temperature down, temperature up, and the in the seven segment display. So that's it, and I guess the next thing to do is to plug it in and we can take a look and kind of watch how it uh, operates and talk a little bit about uh, how it functions. Okay, so the blanket's on the floor and we plugged it in there and now we can turn the controller on uh, without it uh, showing an error indication and hopefully it'll work. So we'll go ahead and flip the power on now. Now the board is live. And... There we go, had the, uh, the dis display segment test and now the power on, let's try this. Ah, there we are. And down, down, down. Up, 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 up. And it's looking good. So yay. So if you look at the bottom of the plastic molded case of the controller, you'll see there's a patent number. And if you look that up online, you'll, you'll find this 1999 patent, which uh, surprisingly enough, just expired today. It's uh, May 5th, uh, 2019 when I'm recording this, which means I guess we can all go into the electric blanket controller business now without fear of legal reprisal. Uh, anyway, this is a great read because it describes the implementation of an idealized controller. Most of it's concerned with the design of the uh, coaxial uh, heating loop and, and, and sensor wire around it, but, but there is a this flow chart which uh, describes an idealized implementation of, of how the software inside the, the MCU would work. And I honestly believe, think, uh, think most of this is, is correct. So you uh, power it on, the controller looks and sees if there's a stored power setting. If so, it uses that. It does a safety check to uh, make sure that the uh, resistance of the sensor wire is, is not zero, indicating it, 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 it isn't shorted to the, to the heating loop and then it goes ahead and turns on power. Now this describes a preheat cycle. So the idea of a preheat cycle, at least as described here, is that it'll take your uh, temperature you've asked for, add two to it, and take it up to that on the first heating cycle and then let it drop down to what you um, uh, requested. I have no indication that's actually what happened. I've been looking at it on the scope and I'll show it to you here in just a second. Then the other thing of note is that the, the, the um, Patent also describes two timers. Uh, one is what I would call a debounce timer, which is a short timer. It says 20 seconds in 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 this document. Looking at it on the scope, uh, it may only be five seconds in the way it's actually implemented. But uh, the idea is to, if the, the temperature is close to a boundary between two uh, two settings, uh, you don't want the controller to to um, bounce back and forth but between the two. So you want to debounce that and um, and give it a little hysteresis so it um, stays in one setting. So there's a little kind of minimum, you have to, when you switch the heating off, you have to stay off for a minimum amount of time before you turn it back on. So you don't go on, off, on, off, on, off as you get to a, a boundary. And then the other timer that's described is a, what I would call a dead man timer, which is on the order of 10 hours or so. And that gets reset every time you touch one of the UI controls. Um, so if you turn it on and leave it on heating, but don't, but don't touch it for, 10 hours, then it then it switches the everything off after the after the 10 hours. So there's an auto shut off feature. I haven't tested that because uh, I don't want to wait around for 10 hours, but I have no reason to believe that that uh, wouldn't work because it's a simple piece of software. So I wanted to watch the heating loop cycle on and off, and the easiest way to do that is to monitor the gating line on the triac. So I've connected the scope up to pin 13 of the microprocessor and ground, and the colors of my leads are reversed because my smaller grabber is the uh, black one. And uh, so now we can watch the microprocessor turning the heating loop on and off. Okay, so let's turn this on to one cold blanket. And on the scope now, you're looking at a very slow sweep. Of, it's about 50 seconds from the left edge to the right edge of the, of the scope. So most of a minute. And then um, it's a two volt scale. So that's like a 4.2 volt um, height of this thing. And now you can see the controller is, is putting the heat to the, the uh, heating loop to, to, to bring the temperature up to the one we have asked for, which won't take long. And now it seems like that has stopped. So that's our minimum off time, perhaps. And then I think in a second he'll, he'll, he'll start to, there we go. Now he's starting to do heating cycles to keep the, the temperature at, at the one setting. 
and we've come around back to the left side as it slowly sweeps across. Um, so this is about as interesting as watching paint dry, so let me um, speed it up a little bit. Okay, so now we're going eight times faster, and you can kind of see it um, cycling uh, uh, regularly. Let's um, take the temperature up now to midway to five, and we'll go really fast now. And you can see it uh, putting a lot of heat to the sensing loop to um, uh, take it up. That was um, four minutes and 43 seconds to, to get to here, and now it's uh, cycling at, at level five. I don't know what those small uh, breaks in the um, uh, uh, triac line uh, are. I think maybe the microcontroller is taking timer interrupts or something, since I believe it's only clocked at 60 hertz. It, it may actually take so much time to, to service an interrupt that, that you can actually see it on the display here as a discontinuity in the, in the heating profile. So let's burn through another minute here really fast. And now we're settled down at level five and you can kind of see it's like 10, 11, 12 seconds on and five seconds off or so, which, uh, and that's our, our, our mid level. So let's go ahead now and crank it up to high. And six, seven, eight, nine, high. And right away the controller puts uh, the heating loop on and leaves it on. And honestly, I let this sit here for 11 minutes and 47 seconds and it never started cycling. So. Then we turned it all the way down to one to see how long it takes to fall back to one. And it goes off. And now we're looking at about eight minutes and 10 seconds as it gets cooler, cooler, cooler. And then finally it starts cycling uh, back at one. Okay, I know this video is already 42 minutes long and I can't believe I've made a 42 minute video on an electric blanket controller or that anyone would watch it, but uh, Thank you. Um, I promised we'd look uh, briefly at the, the 2010 board, and it will be very brief because I don't have much to say about this. Obviously, it's the same idea, but the components are laid out a little differently. You can see the uh, LM393 is, is up and down uh, here. The, the two, uh, the thrisistor and the transistor, have been um, grouped together here. The, the heating fuse has been moved up from this corner to here. And actually, this was the original design, so it's the 2015 board that's, that's different. Uh, you may say, where is the triac? There's obviously a space for it on the board, and it's actually uh, on the other side here, uh, mounted, and they're using the, this foil as a, a heat sink, and I guess that may not have worked very well, since by 2015 redesign, they decided to spend the, the pennies and, and put an actual full-blown heat sink onto the board, so maybe they lost a lot of triacs. So that's all I'm going to say about the, the, the 2010 board. Ah, uh, so I guess that's more than anyone ever needs to know about electric blanket controllers. I've got my two here, my originals that are, are working again. The 2010 one needs a, a replacement capacitor. Uh, and that's another thing I found out, that the uh, 2015s in this plastic have a round window for the LED display. And the 2010 has got kind of an elongated, uh, more oval-shaped window with a rounded corner it stands up. It's not a perfect circle. So that may be a way you can tell from the outside whether you have a, a, um, a 2010 or 2015 model. I don't know if that always correlates, but it's anyway something you can check. I have to order a placement capacitor. Um, so uh, when I finally got everything out of circuit and measured it, the, the one that was bad actually is, is showing bad on my tester now which it wasn't before. Uh, the one in, in, in mine that was working um, at the start of this video and is still working uh, is um, like 0.6 microfarad, but the ESR is also like um, uh, 0.6. So um, that doesn't seem too good. And then the one I got off the 210 board is 1.5 microfarad, and its ESR is 0.22, so that seems better. So as far as what to order, um, I guess uh, bigger is better, so I'll go like one and a half or one microfarad, depending on whatever the common sizes for this for this package are. Anyway, so there they are. They're working, and I'm warm. And uh, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. And and if you see my wife somewhere, tell her she can come back now, and 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 her side of the bed will be warm, and and I can stop hugging these controllers. Bye. One morning 
at breakfast, my wife approached me and said, uh, you know, my electric blanket control is fucked, and I wish I were dead, and I hate you, and my whole life is a sham, and I can't believe we're still married. Oh, my God.